Sebastian for the next talk. Feel free to start. Hey, um, hi, my name is Sebastian Tietke. Welcome. If you want to have a seat, I'll I stall a little bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm Sebastian. I'm the CTO um, and co-founder of Stateful. And we happen to make an open source project called RunMe, which is fairly new. Um, I've been sort of like in software and cloud and operations for 20 plus years. Um, and yeah, let's get started. Cool. So I have a confession to make. Um, I talked to all of your math teachers. You know, I thought it wasn't enough to go to a conference before a conference. So at another conference with your math teachers before the conference. And they all said the same thing. You know? They basically said that you guys were great about you know, finding the solution. But you, know, you didn't always write down the steps how you got there. And you know, while that's great, it doesn't demonstrate that you knew how to get there. But more applicably, it didn't document it for others. Right? So it's a little joke but it's also applicable because this is about documentation. And what I want to prove to you is that, you know, a IDE for operators, you know, you could ditch the D, um, needs to be central to your documentation or integral, I should say. Um, you know, we do the same thing in tech, right? We, we're very good about like producing solutions. We take pride in it. We love doing it and we ship them, right? We, we push them out, we move on to the next project, right? Um, sometimes we're better about writing some docs and leaving a trail, other times we are not, right? Um, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, things haven't changed all that much. Um, the one thing that's very different is, you know, math and physics don't change as much as technology does, right? And I don't need to quantify the order of magnitude, you know, how, I, I mean, I don't know how fast math changes, but it's very slow. <laughs> um, and, but tech is like, it's uncoordinated, there's, you know, actors, you know, companies, standout bodies that constantly just change things, right? So I guess what I'm trying to get at is that um, the how you get to a solution, you know, actually changes pretty frequently, right? So when you look at documentation, what you, tends to end, uh, age actually pretty well, or when it changes, it's almost obvious, is the, the what, right? Maybe the why, right? But those two things are less susceptible to bit rot, than, than the how, right? Because it's not like everything is like a car where you have, you have an automatic transmission. You just know to put it in D and it will drive, right? You put an R and it will, you know, it's like almost like a declarative interface to it, right? Uh, instructions, you know, the how is oftentimes, here's the steps you take, log into your AWS console, here are a bunch of screenshots, right? And good luck, those screenshots are probably gonna be different next week, right? So my point is like, it's also not as easy, right? So, um, but, I'm here to like make a case that you know docs should be integral to this to these integrated environments for operators, right? If you ditch the D here in the IDE, um, I know I'm kind of like almost made a case against it, right? <laughs> Just talking to you guys here, but you know I do want to show you that it's actually possible, right? Um, and you know Kubernetes to the rescue? No, kidding. Uh, notebooks to the rescue. Um, I do think Kubernetes is great. The one thing I will say is like. There's a bit of a halo around Kubernetes, and I think it kind of made us so that we're not innovating as much as I would like to on the side of things that interface with humans, right? Your terminal, your browser, your editor, right? I mean, I'm not saying IDEs don't progress, but I think, you know, we, we've been like overly focused on sticking more stuff into an API that runs on the other side, right? And this, I'm not trying to say this is a zero sum game, right? That's my whole point. It's like, I think we can do both, right? So Kubernetes is great, but this is about notebooks. Um, so for, you know, some of you, and it's interesting that I have a screenshot and you guys don't, um, but imagine it would be a Jupyter Notebook here. It's really weird because it's definitely on my screen. Um, sorry? Magician, this guy figured it out. Um, so there's a, there's a notebook here, and notebooks um, are essentially like a very good example of like how this sort of math way of demonstrating, not just that you know how, but sharing with others, and breaking it down into incremental steps. Some of which you actually, at the time of running, don't even have to comprehend, right? It's kind of like the superpower. But then when you want to, I mean, you need to, you can, right? And I think those are two good properties to have, right? So, you know, like, I'm not trying to make a case for Jupyter Notebooks, but I think it's demonstrated really well how powerful this could be, right? This is great for data scientists, great for you know, NL, you know, any form of analytics. It's great for ML, but it's not necessarily built for the cloud, right? And cloud native and operations. 
So what we've done uh, with Runme is we said, like, look, if we could do what Jupyter did for ML and data science and just run our docs that interface with the cloud, wouldn't that be great, right? And, you know, by the way, I'm just putting this in here to be very clear. I know we have pipelines, right? But pipelines are not interactive, right? And any, I mean, I'm sure we've all tried to do that. <laughs> and it kind of works, but it doesn't work great, right? Because it's not made for humans. It's made for machines, right? And I'm not trying to make the case against uh, pipelines. I think they can, these approaches can be complementary, right? Because you can run your notebook in a pipeline, turns out. Um, so just you know, a quick rundown of Run Me, and I'm going to demo a lot of stuff that is related to how we're using open technology. So I'm not going to try to spend a ton of time on this. But essentially, you can imagine, if you know Jupyter, that Run Me is a notebook implementation with a notebook kernel. But the kernel is not Python. It's, um, it's Bash but it's also like a cloud native flavor of Bash. So it is fully Bash compatible, but it can do more, right? And what, what that means, I'm gonna show in a moment. And as I said, it runs in CI, it brings all these concepts, like, or like all these tools that you use, like a terminal, an editor, and all that into one place, right? Um, and um, best of all, it kind of like gets you to a point where you can create kind of like micro control planes around a narrow description um, of a project, right? So your documentation doesn't have to go, you know, go over to the walled garden of the AWS console and find the thing that you need to look for, right? It kind of brings it into the documentation. So uh, let's actually hop over to the demo. Adam, if you could help me. So um, actually, let's start here. So you know, like Runme is essentially just um, here, Richard Upload. Uh, it's essentially just Markdown. So you can imagine, you know, like looking at this, this is a readme file, it's just a markdown document. The Wi-Fi here is terrible, which is why this is taking so long. Um, but, you know, when, when it opens and it shows you the raw markdown, you will see it's just markdown. Maybe we'll skip that step. <laughs> um, what we've done is, and it kind of ruins my surprise effect, is that I can just click that button and it just should pop me into a notebook. Um, let's wait one second. Come on. I already killed most of the parts that were somewhat online because of the Wi-Fi. Okay, well, I'll flip over and start it anyways. So if I hit the button, it usually pops it open, but it has to make an API call, like a, uh, it hits a remote URL to resolve a local URI. Um, but my point is, this is literally Markdown, and I can show it in here because it's not online, right? So on the right side, you see basically what you know, Markdown. I can even render it in a preview, right? Same thing, nothing is different, right? It, reads Markdown and it renders Markdown, but what uh, uh, Runme will do is like it actually makes it available as a notebook so I can run my steps, right? And you know, it's a, way, a good way to escape confluence and put your documentation back into your repo so it sits next to your infrastructure as code or your, you know, your, your Ansible playbooks or, or even like your services for that matter, right? This is not something that is specifically meant for, you know, operators. You can use it for development, but you know, I think this is a really good solution for people like ourselves that have the key to the castle, right? The platform other people that don't always can rely on a pipeline, right? Um, and you know, again, when I save this and I open it again, it's just Markdown, right? It just writes it back, you know, serializes it back into Markdown. Um, so we have Markdown here. This runs inside of VS Code. It's built on the VS Code platform. So you can think about it as like, it's like Chromium, not Chrome, right? So it can run in VS Code, but it can also run in Gitpod. It can run in code spaces. It can run uh, as a web app locally, right? So there's a big portability aspect to it. And it always comes with a terminal, an editor, a play button, uh, and you can also record the output, right? Um, so I'm not gonna do the prerequisites because Wi-Fi is bad, but you know, like you can describe these are all the steps it takes to install something. Or you can run the whole thing in a dev container and have all the stuff already installed because VS Code lets you do that, the VS Code platform where you can attach it to a Bastion host and have all the dependencies there. So you don't have to concern yourself with like, is my base system ready to go, right? Um, so let's skip to the first step. Um, so to break up this walled garden that like cloud consoles can be and like, let's cross our fingers, this is not gonna take half an hour to like reach the world and come back uh, due to the Wi-Fi. But um, while we're doing it, let's start this one too. Uh, this usually takes split seconds if you actually have an internet connection. <laughs> um, but you know what, what essentially will happen, and it ho hopefully happens in a couple of seconds, is that you, know, you will actually get a uh, list of your clusters with all the metadata like you would in the GCP console, right? It kind of is annoying that it doesn't do this right now. 
but um, this is uh, entirely due to the internet. Um, anyways, I kind of move on and come back and see if it worked. Um, and um, you know, when you share notebooks, you do want to share them in a way that other people can use them. So what Rummy does is it like piggybacked on this export nature, right? That you're exporting environment variables. But if they're unknown, you know, you can, <laughs> yeah, I guess we can't get out of the internet. But I'm happy to show you guys if you want to see it, right? And I, um, it's really cool, unfortunately. Um, so this prompting based on exported variables kind of works in a way that like you can either make it a prompt, like I do here, enter your project ID, or you know you can make it a default value. So you can just confirm it, right? And a project ID happens to be run me CI, and then you know this is a default value here, so I can change it, and I could scroll up to my cluster listing if it was there, if we had internet, but <laughs> uh, but like you know I just confirm it, right? And um, Hopefully this will not fail, but it probably will. So we'll just move on. This is entirely because the internet is not working, right? So this command here, the gcloud command, will just get you a kube context, right? And then I could go on and deploy an app in the cluster, and you know show you guys how to like tail the pods at the same time, all within the the notebook here, right? And but the sad part <laughs> is the internet doesn't work, so I can't. But you know we're gonna continue to, uh, uh, through it anyways. So all of this, both the terminal inside of it, as well as these cloud resources that you can inline, right? You can do it on the cluster level, you can do it on the VM level. You know, it's like, um, it's basically just a renderer on top of the API, right? Um, it's our web components. So what I'm showing you here is like, all of it is open source, some of it is like steered by Microsoft, but it is entirely, you know, based on open standards, open source, right? O comp web components are W3C. Anyway, so, um, there's a lot of open source in here, and um, let's continue. I mean, I'm gonna see if GitHub is maybe a better, you know, bet. Um, so we can even like inline GitHub workflows, right? And that's cool for two thing reasons. You can either trigger one, or you can just check in on if your um, if your jobs, you know, passed, right? But you know, I'm not gonna put a bet on it because it looks like the internet is getting in the way. <laughs> um, and uh, lastly, um, when it comes to uh, open standards, we also support open telemetry. So I'm not gonna do the, I wanted to pull in the SVG that renders the logo, but that's kind of like besides the point because it goes out to the internet. But um, what should have happened while I did this is it should have sent open telemetry traces to a Jaeger backend and it did. Um, I guess this is a previous run, but it does this anyway. So. You know, you can see how I have a run me session, it runs in like inside of a notebook and in the cells and all the metadata. You know, it's, it's sort of like still in development, so there's gonna be a lot more information available, including what prompts popped up. So you do get this sort of like uh, paper trail and you know, it's all local, right? So you, you, you have control over it as a user. It's not like it's looking over your shoulder, right? If you run a cell and somebody says, well, we configured it to send it off to the security team, it's not like somebody is just, you know, tapping into your terminal, right? It's very explicit, right? And obviously it's like stuff that you can use, you don't have to, right? Um, and you know, I'm not gonna show the open, uh, the, the, the dev container, because I'm also worried that it's gonna try to pull something down from the internet. But you could literally, on my machine here, I could run this whole notebook inside of a container and have all of my prerequisites installed. And then that image I could give to anybody here, right? Where I could use our existing supply chain security and only use images that, you know, went through the vetting process, right? So it really kind of like just, layers into all this, these existing technologies, right? Cool, hopping over here. Sorry about the internet, but that's not something I can control. Um, so in a lot of ways, you know, like my, my sort of thesis is like, if you run your documentation, it will not fall behind, right? If you make it like the front and center of like how you share knowledge, how you platform others, right? I mean, obviously if you can platform people with a pipeline, please do, right? I'm not arguing against that. But I know that like, you know, if you have people on call and pager duty, run books, Right, there's like a lot of handy dandy stuff you can do just to gather information and you know, like benefit from retrospectives and outages, right? Uh, yeah, um, but I need you again though. Um, but there's a little bit of an elephant in the room where um, the, the hardest thing about making these notebooks generic yet personal enough that you can just run them is the good old you know, configuration and secrets problem, right? And I know a lot of people are gonna probably tell me we have Vault, we have Secret Manager, we have Cloud KMS, we have SOPS, yada, yada, yada. But my point is, that's for machines. That's not for humans, right? I, I'm not saying that you can't store your secrets there, but it doesn't make it easier for humans to find them necessarily, right? And you know, in a lot of ways, it seems like 
that there's sort of a dichotomy where you can either couple your scripts, your documentation to your personal environment, which I call the dot files, right, just as a label, or you can like couple it to your, you know, uh, delivery infrastructure, right? You stick it into GitHub or GitLab or whatever you use, you can like manage your environments and all that. But at the end of the day, it's coupled to one or the other, you can't have both, right? So what that leaves you with, I don't know if you go, guys know this meme is like, you know, being told like draw the two circles and draw the rest of the effing out, right? Which basically means go ahead and reverse engineer it, <laughs> you know, whatever side of the aisle you're on, right? And, um, you know, and for example, working at MVA, right? But going from one to the other is, is not as easy as putting the car in drive, right? So I did the thing that I said I would never do and I looked at this and I was like, hey, why doesn't the environment have a type system? And you know, I went even further and then I decided to build one. Um, so the idea here is that you know, like everything should live inside of the repo. Why can't we have a bill of materials that defines what your environment should look like? Kind of like you know, a CRD that then can be reconciled, right? But something that can run locally as well as on an SSH bastion host, but also inside of a pipeline, right? And you know, I sort of like convinced myself that this is something that needs to exist. And I figured I have enough computer science jobs to figure out how to do string, string values, right? If I had nested objects, maybe I would have not tried it because I'm really not that good at computer science. Um, so the idea really is to like have this triangle relationship, right? You have a set of environments, can be for humans, can be ephemeral, can be permanent. And obviously you have, even if you have just two keys and you know, one of them might be sensitive, the other one might just be a variable, right? You already have that problem, right? It's like kind of like, once you have another teammate, you have to share knowledge, right? It's like, unless you do it all yourself, you're basically exposed to the problem, right? And, you know, I feel very strongly that documentation should be in your repo, code should be in your repo. Why can't we have a specification of the environment? So, yeah, I went ahead and did it. I had this in my head probably for two years, and then, you know, since I had this talk, I had an excuse to actually build it, sort of. And, you know, I called it Project Owl because, remember, the owl. Also, the owl is a very wise animal, turns out. So the idea here really was, you know, build a way how we can specify, validate, and resolve, right? But the resolution here is flexible, right? So we get to that. Environments, so that we can make them verifiably correct, right? And like, the things that I kind of looked at is like, I liked what the SSH agent did for keys, and like how you have APIs that make it easy to stick stuff inside of it, but you can't actually really read it out, but you know it's there, and you can kind of check that it's correct. Um, and I like the relationship that TypeScript has with JavaScript, even though you could argue why is TypeScript not just JavaScript, right? But, you know, like, the type system shouldn't be, you know, you have to adopt it all, right? It, it should be progressive, right? You can have as much of it as you need, because the environment usually is like, you have 100 environment variables, but five or six of them are actually really the, the difficult ones, right? Um, and, you know, like, so to kind of get closer to this idea of that you can just single sign on to every environment, right? And, like, whether it's you know, like a personal one, whether it's a machine environment, whether it's a ephemeral one, you should just be able to use your identity or any other contextual information, what machine you're running on, uh, and that's sort of the resolution aspect. So um, looking at this you know, real quickly, I kind of like need to make sure that I'm not running out of time. Um, I looked at what are we already using, right? And it turns out that like this examples file, that .env.example is pretty dominant, or like .sample, fill in your blank, right? So what I did, and this is really just a interface to it, it's like sort of a front end or facade, if you will. I kind of came up with like an annotation, you know, way of just adding a comment, a type, which I call spec because everything is a type, kind, type, 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 everywhere. So I call it a spec, an environment spec fits really well. So you have a concrete type, and there can be many of them. This is like the subset of it, what, which I built in the last month. And you know, it's basically more about security and making it so that you can shield yourself from like not taking screenshots of your environment without having you know, masking and all that. And then an exclamation mark just means like mandatory, right? It's like it, it has to be there, right? So when you start out, you, you pull in a repo, you, you know, it will like look at your environment and tell you what's not there, right? Which is, in my mind, already a pretty big help, right? And then you know, like, if you made more concrete types, you could even go, regex is obviously very uh, specific, but you could have a DB URL checker. You could have a host or like a socket checker, right? So you could like formally validate that the value also is correct in the way it looks, right? Maybe you can even make a ping to a database and see if you can connect, right? So there's a lot of tooling you can also build on top of it, which I think is pretty exciting because like what TypeScript has done for JavaScript developers is not just make it type safe, it's also built a lot of cool tooling, right? So you can have autocomplete and 
and all that sort of stuff. And I think that's what we're missing in user land, right? So, you know, the relationship is this, I'm just gonna blast through this real quick. Name, value, we already know that. The values some oftentimes are just dummy values, but now we have this spec idea, right? And it kind of like creates this relationship that you have to have these three things to be able to like establish correctness, right? Sort of at a compiler level almost, if you will. Um, and then what I've done is like I want it for users not to having to be exposed to any of the internals. That's why this dot, uh, env dot example interface is really easy to adopt and you can just use as much of it as you want, but inside of it is a graph and it's using the GraphQL type system to traverse that graph. You don't have to write any queries. It's not, it's not a, you know, a, a data API. It just uses a graph to model you know, your environment, the types, and the resolution. And at the end of it, it just traverses it and spits out a .env, right? A serialized key value pair, right? Like a, a list of them. But the cool thing is that as you traverse the graph, you can use contextual information like authentication, YDC credentials. I mean, like all of stuff that I haven't built yet, but it's infinitely like, you know, uh, powerful, right? And you know, the hardest part is like, how do you build an interface on top of it that is not the graph, right? So you can use it like the dot .env dot .example, but like I kind of want to do that, but I need more input, right? Um, and the idea really is not to reinvent the world, it's like just connect the dots, right? If your secrets live in Secret Manager or in Vault or AWS, you know, maybe you can just use a convention to resolve them, right? If you have the right, you know, uh, permissions, the right role that you can assume, you should be able to do that. Why not let the graph handle that for you? Make the owl do it. And, you know, I'm calling this the owl store because it's inside of the kernel right now, but it's not an integral part to run me. It can, it can also run on its own. Um, and what it will let you do is like the SSH agent, it essentially will let you um, formally, like it will let you interact with it, it has APIs, and um, it will be able to like resolve um, environments if I were to build that, right? So like the idea really is to like, use OWL as a thing that can be by itself and stand alone and solve this problem in sort of a Unixy way, right? Like as a tool that is universal, right? And also OWL is a much cooler three letter acronym than ENF. I thought. So I'll store and store kind of works, right? Uh, so enough of the theory. I'm just going to blast through this. Adam, can you hold the microphone, please? So I've kind of been using this while you guys weren't watching. Um, you know, we built a UI on top of it. It's all gRPC interfaces. So it's, you know, we also have a CLI for it. But if I reset my session here, you know, you can kind of see how those things are unset, right? And the reason why that is, is because I defined it here, right? My environment obviously has all these system and can come from my profile, whatever I stuck in there. So the M store assumes that like if it's not known, it's semi-sensitive. So don't show it to anybody. But if I wanted to, because it's semi, it's, you know, we don't know what it is, I can, right? So it's not marked as a secret. I call that opaque, right? So if I now took a screenshot, I can be reasonably safe that I'm not leaking anything, right? Um, and you know, this is, it's pretty simple that way. And then can you bring it a little closer. And then um, it will also be smart enough that like if it already has a value, if, if for example, I go in my .env file and enable this and reset my session, you know, it will show me where that value came from, right? So this came out of .env because like, I'm sure you guys have done this before where for the life of it, your process has an environment variable you could not figure out where it came from. Well, it took much longer than it should have, right? Um, the one thing that I should probably mention, and we'll get to that in a moment, um, try not to run out of time, is um, that I'm not just saving a value, I'm saving like basically transactional changes to the environment. So it, it, you know, at any point in time it will be snapshotted, so it would you know, almost run the total of it and show you what the environment looks like at that point in time. But conceivably you could traverse the graph at a later time. So you can also like figure out how it evolved over time if you wanted to, right? If you wanted to like really see, oh I ran a cell and I, you know, test cluster, right? Or, one, two, three, four, five, and boom, the values aren't here, right? My secret is masked. It's not really a secret, but I did that for demonstration purposes, right? And even the prompt that I can rerun, well, if I actually rerun it, it already has value, so we'll just skip it, but I can force it to like prompt me again, right? And again, this resolution mechanism of using a prompt in, in the notebook UI is just one way of resolving it, and in my mind, it's the last resort, right? It's like. If I can't figure out what the configuration is, if it's the master password for the DB that's in my one password, maybe I actually want it to ask me, right? Like, do everything else and then, you know, ask me for the one critical thing and I'll go look it up. But don't ask me for the endpoint, the host, the DB URL, yada, 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 right? So, like, the idea really is to, like, make it as easy as possible but also pragmatic, right? 
And you know, the same thing is available in the CLI. Um, maybe I'll skip over that because I hope you guys just trust me <laughs> that it's there. Actually, I can run it real quick. Run me in snapshot. And you know, I can do all, and it shows you the whole thing. But you know, my, the whole point is like, this is not merely to run me. Um, yep. Cool, so going back here, this was the demo of it. It works end to end, it's experimental. You know, I'm not a very good Go developer, but I'm pretty proud of myself. <laughs> uh, it looks a little un ugly under the hood, but it works well. So um, I already talked about this, so I'm gonna breeze through that. Um, you know, the, on the outside, it's inf, dot inf, dot inf example. On the inside, it's a graph. You don't have to know anything about it if you're not, if you're not working, if you not wanna extend it on the internals, right? It's totally possible to put another fa fa facade or a front end on top of it, which could be a CRD and then a Kubernetes controller that does the reconciliation, right? But the whole point was like to not marry it to one specific, you know, thing, right? And like, especially not to a server exclusively, right? Something that's not, doesn't live on the, on, you know, can't run on the, on locally at, at the user, right? At the human, right? And, you know, it happens so that run me uses the, the last resort default resolution is prompting, but that shouldn't be the end of it, right? So, you know, I do want people to tell me what they think and what they want so I can maybe prioritize things a little bit because I could build anything and that's really, really not a good thing usually. Uh, just real quick, this is how it looks on the inside. So I told you that like, it kind of like adds to the thing as you run through the notebook, but you could conceivably do this with, you know, terminal sessions. You know, there's like a lot of things you can do. And then it has the whole, you know, uh, defining those specs, overlaying them and then validating them, right? Like right now I don't do correctness, I only do mandatory or not, right? Because there's only so much one can do in a month. Um, and then um, again, the GraphQL engine that's on the inside, it does that, it's completely agate, no network interface, it's all in memory, right? It has nothing, it's, it is not a GraphQL server. I wanna be very clear about this. Uh, and then, you know, this is kinda how it looks like on the inside, you can even build a different front end how to get these specs into the graph where then how you do a resolution path, right? And I kind of like, this is made up, but I, I kind of have a little bit of a POC implementation where you can then add to the graph and this can also be a different facade, right? Nobody has to write this query. You know, I could stick this into a CRD and then generate that query because it's just an AppSec syntax tree and I just rendered it so we can look at it, right? Um, and you know, like you can basically have a chain of things and then try to resolve values and then if you can't resolve the last one, you can prompt the user, right? where maybe you can resolve them all. And it really also depends on how much effort you wanna put in, right? But it gives you the whole toolbox. Toolbox, yeah. So, you know, just to be clear, absolutely no GraphQL in user land. It's just, you know, I'm showing you guys how the sausage is made. Um, and then, you know, this is an example of uh, different facades, right? It could be a CRD, right? That just defines the spec. There could be a CRD that tells you how to take the specs and then run it through the graph and grab the values from sealed secrets or from AWS secrets manager, right? I haven't built that yet, but it can be done. I also have this plan of like, you know, using run me in a way kind of like how cloud functions work, but they run locally, right? That you, you know, you basically just name the cell after the key. And then if you are locally, you know, maybe there's a resolution mechanism that actually just get, generates a key because like you're running in development and who cares, right? And just make this like that simple, right? And uh, or like you use, like use a CLI tool that already runs through an OIDC flow and just spits out the token and it just gets sucked up into the graph again, right? And you know, you, the, the idea here really is to build a common set of specs that do all this stuff so we can share them, right? So you don't always have to reinvent the wheel. You know, we can, we can define our um, uh, environments with common specs. We can resolve them, right? It's sort of like a tool that benefits the community, right? And you know, I'm really interested to hear what you guys think and you know, um, that's kind of it. I'll be, you know, at the KubeCon C30, happy to talk right after, happy to talk, show you guys all the stuff that didn't work because of the internet, which is really cool, I promise. And uh, yeah, that's it, email me if you have questions, if you like this, if you hate it. I also wanna hear if you hate it. Really, I do. I'm not gonna take it personal. Oh yeah, thank you. Merci. So, thank you very much, Sebastian. I think we have one minute left. Does someone of you have a question to the speaker? I did build a type system for the environment, so somebody has to have an opinion about this, please. <laughs> Any questions? Hmm? No? Just sinking in still. So okay. you, then you just uh, left no questions? I know, I know. So it's basically perfect is what that is. <laughs> Either this or just no one was understanding what you're talking about. <laughs> Well, if, if you have questions or, you, you know, something didn't compute, just come to me. Like, I'm happy to talk about it. And I really want to talk about it. There's a lot in my head. 
Thank you. Okay. Merci. So now we have a lunch break.